if you take a medicine and think it's made you sick, we'd really like to ask you to report it pretty quick. If you've had a vaccine and you're feeling less than great, the Yellow Card reporting team don't want you to wait. Get online, pick up the phone or use their app to share descriptions of your symptoms. It's true, they really care. Anyone can tell us if a vape or an inhaler is causing patients problems or an insulin pen's a failure. Even herbal medicines, don't just throw them in the bin. With sufficient data, we can get a safety win. If you see a triangle, a black one, just like this, you know that Charlie's watching to make sure that nothing's missed. When meds are new and used at scale, a careful watch is needed. Any news of side effects is something to be heeded. Medicines will be safer if we know just what they do. Everything you share with us is looked at like a clue. Headaches, sickness, rashes, or perhaps you're feeling dizzy. The Yellow Card reporting team is happy to be busy. Please tell the Yellow Card team about any unexpected or adverse reactions to any medicines you've taken or medical devices you've used. Thank you. Please know I've just started back at the gym. I wasn't sure if I was going to make that actually, that, uh, <laughs> but I am trying to save your uh, your drug bill by getting um, a bit healthier and a bit more um, a bit more active. So as you heard, I'm Sophie Howe. I'm the Future Generations um, Commissioner for Wales. I hope that the um, the Future Generations Act won't be um, something entirely new to you. Um, from the conversations that I've had with um, with colleagues in the room, I know that um, that it's not something that you are taking. Um, very seriously and of course that's absolutely um, essential. I've just returned from um, COP in, um, in Egypt. Um, I'm not returning happy I have to say. Um, I was at COP in Glasgow last year where the 193 um, member states of the UN made commitments to come back um, to this year's COP with revised action plans because what we were seeing in terms of the current commitments even if they were delivered, and most of them aren't being <laughs> delivered, um, but even just on the basis of the current commitments, we are way, way off um, 1.5 degrees, we're way off 2 degrees, we're heading um, for upwards of, of 3 degrees. And just to give you a kind of flavour of what that might mean, um, in terms of extreme weather events, um, hurricanes of categories 4 or 5, for example, each 1 degree of global warming um, is likely to increase or increases the likelihood of those sorts of extreme weather events by 25 to 30 percent. So the last kind of crisis before, last but one crisis perhaps in Wales, remember the flooding just before um, COVID, um, those sorts of extreme weather events um, very likely to, um, to be increasing and we are nowhere near um, taking the action that we need to take um, to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, and I suppose, you know, you can sort of say, well, what has medicine got to do with that? What, um, what's the purpose or what's our role in that? And um, this is the third speech I've given today. The, um, the remit that I hold is quite, um, is quite vast. So I spent the morning talking to directors of planning, economy, environment and transport. Um, I spent um, the sort of later morning period talking to... Um, uh, public sector finance um, officials, and um, now I'm talking to you guys um, about medicine, um, about uh, pharmacy, about health. So that's quite a kind of diverse range of things to be talking about, but actually the connections between all of those things are absolutely there if we choose to seek them. So the World Health Organization, for example, um, tells us that when we look at the health inequality gap now, um, where we are here at the moment, probably say a mile down the road compared to where, um, where I live, and I can see a few friends in the audience who live in a similar place to me as well, um, in the north of Cardiff in Whitchurch, there's anything between a 15 and 20 year um, life expectancy gap. 
Um, and, you know, I suppose if you say that to the sort of general public, well, God, what's the health service doing um, about that? That's, that's really awful. What, what, is, um, what is happening there? But what the World Health Organization tell us is that actually the difference or the reasons for that life um, inequality gap, only 10%. Um, is accounted for by what the NHS or the healthcare system itself does. So there's a bit of a kind of disconnect there, isn't there? Because um, here in Wales, across the UK, we're spending around 50% of our budget. Most years, it goes uh, the proportion of the spend goes up. Um, and we all know the reasons for that, the demand on the system, um, perhaps the you know, greater demands than we've perhaps um, ever seen. But actually, it only counts for 10% of the difference in terms of that health inequality gap. So what are the reasons for um, the rest of the gap? 35% is about our income security. Um, whether we can put food on the table, are we living in poverty? 29% is about um, the quality of um, our environment, the quality and our living conditions, if you like. So the quality of our housing, um, are we living in areas of high air pollution? Um, are we living in areas where we have access to public open space? 29% of the difference. If you live in a poor community, you're much more likely to be living in areas of high air pollution. You're much, much less likely to have access to public space. You're much more likely to be living in poor quality housing. And then we get to the next one, 19% of what makes the difference to life um, expectancy and that gap is about social interaction. So it's about a sense of community in the area that you live. It's whether you have a sense of agency in that community. Do you feel part of it and can you make a difference? It's about the quality of your relationships. Do you have people you can turn to in your hour of need? So when we talk about the well-being of current and future generations, well-being can actually, in sort of public policy terms, governments across the world are trying to do what we've already done here um, in Wales and adopt these well-being metrics. Um, but there are some people who think it's this soft, fluffy nonsense, um, you know, this well-being stuff. But actually, when you come back to the hard metrics of well-being, 19% of what makes the difference to whether you live or die young, or younger than you should do, is about social interaction, is about community, is about those things outside of the healthcare system, then actually that focus on wellbeing and having holistic and joined up uh, policy making um, with wellbeing at its core in Wales is far from fluffy, it's absolutely essential. So this is a, um, a poster from or the front of Life magazine in um, 1955. It feels kind of pretty shocking, um, doesn't it? It's kind of um, applauding our throwaway or the emerging throwaway um, lifestyle, throwaway living, disposable items cut down on household chores. Um, and I suppose, you know, so that maybe was kind of the start of it, this throwaway um, culture that is still endemic um, in our society. Because no matter how good we might be, and, you know, shout out to Wales here, um, Wales is third in the world, the entire world, for its rates of recycling. We have an aspiration to be zero waste by 2050. Um, there are lots of other nations who are nowhere near us and who are trying to do, um, you know, mirror and copy the things that um, we are doing. But despite that, um, we are still not operating within our, uh, an acceptable global carbon footprint. So we're currently using about two and a half times worth the planet's resources that are available. So to put that in financial terms, it's like spending 250% of your salary um, every year. What would happen? You'd go bust, wouldn't you? You'd be bankrupt. We're about to do that um, to our world. And although, you know, there are these improvements, you know, really, are we going far enough? Because this is the state um, of our planet um, around... Um, our healthcare system is a massive part of that problem. Um, if the healthcare system um, was a country, and the healthcare system were worldwide now, it would be the fifth biggest emitter um, in the world. So this is where these kind of um, things that I've been talking about today from finance, um, just going back to those floods in, um, in Ponty um, at the beginning of 2020, it will cost hundreds of millions of pounds to put those floods right that or to, to, to deal with the damage from that. That money will, in large parts, come from the public purse. 
Um, it will come from health budgets or money that could have been spent on health. It will come from the local authority's budget. Actually, that local authority is also the local authority that is investing the most in Wales through its pension funds in fossil fuels. So this is where we can see these connections between what we're doing in our own sphere and what is actually um, happening elsewhere and indeed in our own, um, in our own communities. So healthcare does really need to address waste. It needs to address its carbon emissions. Um, Eight million tonnes of pandemic-associated waste has been generated globally, with more than 25,000 tonnes entering the global ocean. Most of the plastic from medical waste generated by hospitals, um, and it dwarfs the contribution from personal protection um, equipment and online shopping package materials. So that is the kind of damage that the healthcare system is actually doing to the planet. Um, and you don't have to be a scientist to recognise that um, human health and planetary health are absolutely um, interlinked. Um, there will be no human health if we have no planet um, to live on. Um, we often have this debate between the economy versus the environment. Um, there are no jobs on a dead planet. So this is where we really need to be recognising um, these connections and acting upon them. And this is where also the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act um, comes in. So hopefully this isn't, as I said, new to you, but the overarching principle of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is that all public bodies in Wales, well, the 48 covered by the Act, and there are more um, to be covered in the coming year, should demonstrate how they're taking decisions in a way which meets today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It then sets out seven long-term well-being goals. Now, I always say you wouldn't think it was revolutionary for a country to have a set of long-term goals. I mean, it sounds pretty blindingly obvious that that should happen to me, but it's completely revolutionary. And herein lies the problem of this kind of almost global planetary collapse, because no other country has these set of long-term goals that they're working towards, um, they operate from one electoral cycle to the next. It's not in the interest of people to take difficult decisions today and to shift money um, today to spend on the long term because they might not be in office in five years' time. But here in Wales, not just set out in a manifesto, not just set out in a five-year programme for government, set out in statute, in law, we have these seven long-term wellbeing goals. They won't change from one political cycle to the next. There are duties on every single one of those institutions covered by the legislation, the Welsh Government included, to set objectives which maximise their contribution to all seven of these wellbeing goals. And that's quite interesting in itself, back to the point that I was making about these connections, because in the past, or perhaps currently in some cases, we're all very used to operating in our, in our silos. We're not necessarily taking that kind of systems um, approach. And what this requires is for all institutions to contribute to all of these goals. So going back to those wider determinants of health, yes, it is just as much the role of housing, of the way in which we do our transport planning, of the way in which we think about protecting our ecosystems um, to deliver on that goal of a healthier Wales as it is for anything the NHS might do. Equally, it's just as much the responsibility of the NHS and all the constituent parts of it to be making sure that you are meeting these other goals as well. What can you be doing to promote cohesive communities? How can you be reducing your own carbon emissions? What could you be doing within your own workforce to tackle that goal um, of a more equal Wales to address socioeconomic um, disadvantage and so on? So it is everyone's um, responsibility. Um, the other thing to point out is that the Act um, covers also five ways of working. And the minister um, who took this legislation through the Senate described this law as the Common Sense Act. Um, because I think that if you look at these kind of five principles for decision making, they're inherently common sense. So you should think about, plan for, consider, show how you've considered 
the long term. Often the things that we do in public policy making terms, um, they're out of date by the time we've finished our task and finish group, which is going to review the whatever policy, because we haven't considered what future trends might be telling us. We haven't considered how that policy might play out with a, um, an ageing population. We haven't considered how that policy might play out in terms of um, the, the uh, increase in artificial intelligence automation. We haven't considered how demographic change might affect um, the policies that we're thinking of. So really critically important to um, think about the long term. And we're also, we're really bad at doing it. We've, you know, still in Wales, we're pretty bad at doing it and we've got a law, but elsewhere across the world, they're even worse um, at doing it. Um, I spend a lot of time with um, futurists. Um, some of the futurist camps are um, the people who deal with existential threat. I suggest that if ever you're having a low day, don't ever hang out with the existential threat people. <laughs> Um, because um, Toby Ord, who is a professor of existential threat, it does exist, at um, Oxford University, says that we have a one in six chance of not surviving the end of this century as humanity. He also says that we spend globally more on ice cream than we spend on foresighting and future trends. So that tells us what value we place on the future and how we consider the future. And we have to put that right in here in Wales. We have a legal obligation to put that right. Prevention, preventing problems from occurring or from getting worse. Practically everything, all the big crises we're dealing with at the moment, entirely preventable. You know, COVID hits us and we're like, oh my God, where did that come from? This is, you know, this is, how, how did this possibly happen? Well, I can tell you in 2018, 2019, the risk of a global pandemic was number eight at the Global Risk Register. And I can tell you also that's what, what's at number one, two, and three every single year for probably about the last 10 years is climate change. We know these things, we are just not acting on them. We have put more carbon into our atmosphere since Al Gore published his first Inconvenient Truth since the UN published their first framework on climate change than at any other time during human history. Are we willfully blind to that? We know what we're doing. We're still doing it. We're still contributing to that planetary um, collapse. So we must get up front of these issues. We must prevent problems from occurring or getting worse. That means some really difficult decisions. It means shifting resources. If any of you came from Newport today and you drove, I hope you might have come by public transport, if you, but if you drove, you might have been stuck at the Bringlass Tunnels. You can blame me um, for that. But although, you know, it's quite a controversial decision, cancelling that M4 relief road, actually it's a really brave decision because what we're saying is if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to get the same results. If we keep investing in roads, we're never going to get modal shift. We're never going to reduce our emissions from transport. Actually, the roads are just going to be as congested as they previously were within 10 to 15 year um, period. We're never going to get the health benefits from active travel. We're never going to get the health benefits from reduced air pollution. So some of those really brave decisions that our government is taking, and you know, I don't always agree with them, but on this I do, some of those brave decisions are critically important. What does that mean about how does that play out in your area of work? Where are the brave decisions that you need to take to shift resources from here, the sticking plaster, to there, the prevention? And those are some of the things that the Act requires. Integration, thinking about the connections between all of our wellbeing goals. Collaboration, working together beyond our sectors, beyond our immediate silos. So critically important because of this point around everything being connected um, to everything. Just down the road in um, Grangetown, and you might have seen it actually popping up all over the city. Um, you might have seen the city greening. Anyone, people here from Cardiff? A few of you, yeah? Are you seeing more greenery pop up in the city? Have a think about it. If you've been to Grangetown, if you've been to Central Square, outside the sort of new train station, uh, the, the uh, plaza outside the new train station and so on. That is purposeful activity to get towards our wellbeing goals. What happened, how that was triggered, was a public health consultant was seconded into the council to help lead on the development of the city's transportation strategy. And when you apply a public health lens to what is essentially um, a trans or starts as a transport problem, you're going to get a completely different set of solutions. And the solution there was we've identified that this area of Grangetown has the lowest levels of life expectancy or amongst the lowest levels of life expectancy, highest rates of air pollution, 
um, from cars and so on. So when you apply a public health lens, you say, oh, actually, what we need to do is we need to put in uh, better public transport and active travel interventions. When we're doing that, we're going to clean and green what was a kind of former concrete jungle. Um, we're going to build in nature-based solutions um, to meet our goal of a more resilient Wales. In doing those nature-based solutions, we're going to take thousands of tonnes of rainwater away from a decrepit sewerage system to prevent that from overflowing, and we're going to make the whole community nice um, and you know, more vibrant and attractive for people to live. That's the sort of thing that you get when you talk to different people, and where you might start with one issue like transport, but you say, what does that look like? What does the solution to that um, look like from a health um, lens? So, the final area is involvement. This is involving citizens. Um, and note, this isn't kind of co-production, uh, sorry, this isn't um, engagement, this isn't consultation. Involvement is a much deeper sense, because um, you know we could only deliver good policy and good services if we understand the lives that people lead, if we understand, try to walk in the shoes of the people who we're delivering um, services for. Now, I'm sure, as you know, many of you work in, in, um, in pharmacy, and I know that you're in a sort of more strategic role, but I imagine um, that many of you might have worked in your sort of, you know, local pharmacies and so on, might have worked in GP practices, and you will have come across people um, like my mum who said, I'm not, I, I'm only, I only want to speak to the doctor, and I only, you know, and I only want to, you, you know, um, and so you need to understand that, and we need to engage with those people, and we need to understand where they're coming from, we need to understand what's going to press their buttons, and how do we shift that behaviour to a different way, because actually, for my mum, a better um, route might not have been the issuing of a prescription for medication, it might have been issuing the prescription um, to join a choir, or issuing of a prescription to have a bike on hire, or issuing of a prescription for park run, or some of those things which can help her physical health, but also her mental health. So there are these things that we need to be thinking of in terms of their connections. If any of you have seen some of the um, stuff in Bromley by Bo, um, some really interesting um, initiatives uh, there, which is really focused on a vision that I have for our NHS, which is a national illness service. Let's be honest about it. It's not a national health service. Its, its primary aim is not keeping people well. It's treating them when they're ill. I think we need to move to a national well-being system or a national wellness system. And in Bromley by Bo, a little microcosm of what that looks like, um, one of my favourite quotes, it's the only place you can go to the GP to drop off a urine sample and join a choir. Now, that's the sort of healthcare system um, and well-being system that I think we need to be creating and that I think we all need to be part of. This sort of stuff is already happening in some parts of Wales. Let me see if I've got a picture of this, because I've completely ignored my uh, pre-prepared slides and I've rented on for a bit. But um, this is um, a picture of the wellbeing hub in, um, in Wrexham. A member of my team uh, went to visit this wellbeing hub uh, recently, absolutely blown away by the holistic nature of it. So they've created... Um, access to information, signposting, handholding to different services all in one place, yoga, health support, a range of services such as befriending, fuel poverty interventions, um, interventions around digital um, inclusion. It's um, home to some state-of-the-art facilities um, that can be used by local community groups, and it's a building where inclusion and accessibility is at the core. In Cumtath uh, Cum Morganug, um, an innovative service provides referred patients with a bespoke nine-month holistic programme to improve their overall health outcomes. Patient empowerment uh, forms the basis of the service, which will be delivered by trained wellness coaches and supported by lifestyle medicine doctors. Elsewhere, across in other parts of the world, where um, this sort of preventative health care is increasingly becoming the norm, in New Zealand, they have a healthy housing programme, a joint initiative um, with Housing New Zealand, a government-owned social housing provider, which helps families get the interventions they need to create a better living environment, especially for uh, their children. And the breadth of this programme um, was 
programs expanded. It focuses on uh, broadly providing warm, dry, healthy housing for families across the countries. Interventions given to these families include help with accessing ins ins um, insulation, beds, bedding, ventilation, heating sources, support with power bills. And an outcome, an evaluation outcome from that showed that for every 10 children referred to this programme, there's an estimated to be one fewer hospitalisation, six fewer GP visits and six fewer filled prescriptions over the following 12 months. So what if we were to do something similar, a really live issue in the news this week, that little two-year-old boy who died as a result of mould and damp in his, in his home, in, a, in one of the richest countries in the world. You know, our whole system has failed that little boy. Our whole system, sadly, will continue to fail more people if we don't start thinking about these innovative ways of doing things, if we don't get outside of our box. In fact, I heard someone say um, a couple of weeks or last week in COP, we shouldn't even do out-of-the-box thinking because that means you start with a box. Um, and what we need to do is completely do away with the box and completely rethink um, the way in which we deliver public services um, for the future. So, I hope that I've given you some food for thought. I hope that I have shown you the connections between what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of your work um, in medicine. I hope that I've got you thinking about how the issue in the prescriptions um, might not be the answer. I'm sure you're already um, thinking um, about that and how working in partnership with others to do completely different things is something that absolutely um, Wales uh, needs and indeed the rest of the world uh, needs. Just to give you, I suppose, a little bit of um, more positive, um, we really are in a unique position here in Wales, being the only country in the world to have legislation um, like this. The, um, I'm coming to the end of a seven-year term. There will be another uh, Future Generations Commissioner holding um, the government and others to account. But when I travel to all parts of the world, because there's lots of interest in the work that we're doing here in Wales and other governments um, adopting it, they, there is, you know, they are envious of this framework that we have. They are envious of the fact that they've got this, oh, we've got this overarching framework that can facilitate a Team Wales approach to doing much better things, to acting today um, for a better tomorrow. And that's come from a tiny place, just over three million uh, population, a tiny place like Wales. The United Nations Secretary General is now taking up our concept and rolling that out at a UN level with a UN declaration for future generations, the appointment of a UN envoy uh, for future generations and reforms to the UN's own governance infrastructure to account for the interests of future generations. So if you ever think you're too small in whatever department you might be working with, whatever role you might be working in, um, us as a nation, actually, you know, small is beautiful. And there are things that if you want to drive that change, if you care about the world that you're leaving behind to your children, your grandchildren and future generations to come, then there are things that you can do now, as I said, to act today for a better tomorrow. Thank you.